There's so many things to talk about. The only question that's always been in my mind is, are we bringing anything to all of these discussions which is of use to anyone? At least we're not sh shouting, because I do think there's an awful lot of misplaced certainty. And I, it's those people who worry me, the people who oh, know they've got the answer. Yeah. And not only are they sure that they've got the answer, but they're convinced that it's vitally important that you have this answer too, whether you want it or not. Well, it's that lo lovely word, hubris. I've said before that, oh, well, I'll sit on the fence, I'll take my time making up my mind. And that's kind of what I mean. I mean, yeah, you're different. You, we're different in that way. I think you do do that. You, you, you do sit in the fence in the sense that you, you don't want to come down on one side or the other, which I think is fine because you're thinking about it and think, well, there's right on this side, but yeah. then on the other side, there's that. I think I'm less like that. I think I do hold a lot of firm opinions, but it's not intrinsic to my sense of self worth that those opinions always be correct. No, if someone comes along and says something to me, and I go. Oh, right. I don't feel lesser. So I don't, there's no, there's nothing in me saying this undermines my sense of self worth if I'm not right. I hold my opinions firmly, but I'm willing to change them. It's my, it's the lovely quote. Um, well, it's one of those quotes within a quote. At the start of Dostoevsky's book, The Brothers Karamazov, which is a fantastic novel, Dostoevsky quotes St. Paul, and St. Paul is quoting God. Yeah, it's a very complicated quote. I probably won't get exactly right. Is God, according to St. Paul, quoted by Dostoevsky, says, Be thee hot or be thee cold, I shall clasp thee to me. Be thee lukewarm, I shall cast thee from me. And that, that's more the way I look at it. I, I'd, I'd like to hold my opinions firmly yeah, uh, rather than be tepid. But I'm willing to change. If someone comes along and says, well, look, yeah, you didn't know about this. Then I'll go, okay, and then I'll hold my next opinion quite firmly. Yeah, well, you've read more books than me. <laughs> <laughs> Just to go back seven years when we were working together, I've started putting up, um, why are we here? Oh, I saw that. That's great. Yeah, I just sort of thought it's hyperland for me. I mean, part of it is ce celebrating Malone and his reading of lots of books and also his knowledge and connections to people I think that aren't necessarily the populist experts in their field I've got a big issue with this and that, and it's something that's come out since we started doing this which is you know democracy for me we sign over I'm not signing I'm giving permission for people to be running things and to be looking at things and to think that you can be an expert on everything, and especially with something like Why Are We Here? You know, in that, you're interviewing people that have spent their lifetime looking at mathematics, looking at ch chimpanzees and how they interact with each other and society. Yeah, I mean, I, it is one of the great joys of my job that I've got to... No, I wasn't to talking about talk. you, mate. <laughs> Fine, I'm not. <laughs> it was hard I was talking about. <laughs> Uh, but it sent some good things. I thought it, it managed to cut through the territory in a different way, and it was just an and it was an interesting series to yeah. be able to make a series where you were saying, "Can you believe in meaning and purpose in the universe?" Yeah, without believing in God, and that was such an interesting, such an interesting topic. And of course, the whole series didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to. Oh, didn't it? Oh, no. So I let you down. I must have told you this. <laughs> You know, when we started, I thought that basically what, once we decided that we would be two presenters going together, which was, I think, the right decision. Yeah. You know, and usually you'd have the scientist would be the atheist and then some other person would be the, you know, the wiffly waffly believer. Yeah. And it was nice that... It was the, the other way around. And I thought, really did think that the whole thing was going to be, uh, I would go on a trip with Ard and Ard would be criticised by all the scientists... Uh, for believing. Yeah. And they'd be cozying up to me saying, well, you know, isn't it odd that this scientist could be so wrong about believing because we all know there's no such thing as God, don't we, David? And I thought that's what would happen. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a fairly fair split, though, wasn't it? I'd sort of say pretty much. Yeah, but, but the weird thing was that the, the religious people, um, 
were all on our, were all on our side going well yeah so people like Novak and yeah um, um, I know where you're going with this yeah <laughs> and then the 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 ardent atheists were also on our side yeah. and they all ganged up on me because the the atheist um like Rosenberg would say to Ard, well, I agree with you, Ard, that the only way to hang on to meaning and purpose in the universe is if, as you do, Ard, you insist that there's a God. And without a God, then you're with me, the ardent atheist, saying yeah. there can't be meaning and purpose. So although they took different sides of the argument, there they was, agreed. Was, they they that, agreed. What, it was cognitive yeah. dissidence, wasn't it? I think. This, well, yeah, and then they would both look at me and go, but him over there, he's just confused <laughs> and weak because he hasn't got the balls to say that that the God exists. Yeah. But he still wants to hang on to meaning and purpose. Yeah. And that was just the oddest thing when that happened. While we were making it, I remember talking to you in the suite and saying, you're not an atheist because you don't, you don't not believe there is a God. Is that no, correct? no, I, I would call myself an agnostic. Agnostic would be, yes. So an atheist is saying there is not a God. Uh, yeah, I don't do that. Yeah, no, and I think if you don't believe one, then fine. Let the people who believe in gods get on with their godly lives. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, the ardent sort of um, new atheist, so Dan Dennett, who I'm going to be talking to in a minute. Oh, right, okay. Uh, I'll tell you about that in a sec. Um, and then Rosenberg and Dawkins and Sam Harris and there's another one, some English fellow, I can't remember his name. Is it Grayling or somebody? It's for them, you they think it's terrible to allow other people to believe in God, that somehow this is just a terrible weakness. Yeah. Um and that they're just wrong. And that that actually brings me to someone else who I'm gonna be talking to. Um, you know, I'm gonna do this thing over in Norway. Norway, yes. There's, yeah, yeah. Um, well, one of the people that we're talking to is this woman called, I think she's called Tanya Lerman. All right. And she's written a book called How God Becomes Real. I was reading it on the train, um, and I found myself sort of hiding the title. Because I thought, <laughs> I know, isn't it terrible? I thought to myself, people, anyone who's going to go, oh, God, he's, you know, it's some God squadder over there. And I, I felt uncomfortable about people even thinking that I was some ardent, you know, yes. tambourine shaking you, God squad. You so I kept turning it over. And then another part of me felt vaguely ashamed for having turned the book over. <laughs> but her book is brilliant. I really like it, How God Becomes Real. And she just has such a brilliant takedown of the silliness of the, the Dawkins, Dennett, Sam Harris you know, ardent atheist yeah. position. It's really good. I'm really looking forward to talking to her. Oh well, I'll 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 look her up. But it was um, yeah. actually it was uh, was it G. K. Chesterton said when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. Yeah. Well, there's that. Yes. Yes. Exactly. One of the people I loved talking to was um, George Steiner. Right. Okay. A fantastic thinker. I, I, I was so pleased to have had the chance to to meet him a couple of times. And yeah. Um, you know, he makes the point that when people don't believe in God, essentially, then what there is is a God-shaped hole in their life and in their world. Yeah. But you've you've yeah. been you've been speaking recently as well to another um, great thinker, Ian McKilchrist. As oh yeah yeah yeah. Tell us about that. Um. I was asked to um, do a live interview with him. You know, I do interviews for the uh, the How To Academy. Oh, the, the, yes. Every now and again, I do a, a an in person one, right? and this one was was with Ian. And yeah. I've known Ian for I don't know twenty. Well, yeah, quarter of a century actually. Why would why wasn't Ian? Why are we here? Good question. I think I felt. That he he comes with such a a whole theory, a whole vision. Yeah. That I thought I can't foist that vision upon on the series, um, and I also felt slightly sort of um, constrained. I thought I can't keep just volunteering my friend, my favourite thinkers. <laughs> Um, and I think probably in retrospect, that was a mistake. I should have just said, look, Ian's an important thinker and he should be in it. Yeah. Yeah, that was probably a mistake on my part. Um, 
But it is fascinating, and, and it's about consciousness, amongst other things. Yeah, and that was that's it. I mean, he, he, yeah, he wrote the book um, in two thousand nine, I think it was uh, eight or nine. I can't remember which one. The Master and His Emissary, where he laid out the the, the his theory yeah. um, of there being the two hemispheres of the of the brain see the world and understand the world in different ways, and that that was as he ruefully always says when he was going to write that book lots and lots of his colleagues said to him oh don't do that you know if you start writing about the two different hemispheres it's professional suicide because that's all just 1970s bollocks and of course the problem was in the 70s it did get popularized you know that's when they did the split brain experiments you know people like Sperry did them and then people did come up with all kinds of of wacky popularist theory saying, well, you know, the the left hemisphere is the accountant and the right hemisphere is the artist. The left hemisphere does mathematics, the right hemisphere does poetry. Yeah. And, is he in, and, and the thing is, it's absolute tosh. Both hemispheres do virtually everything. Yeah. It's not what they do that's different, but how they do it that's yeah. different. Um, and, and, and Ian's theory has a mass of absolute mass of evidence to support it and it's still interesting over the years since he brought it out although it's gathered a huge following yeah um, and not just amongst you know lay people but a lot of you know, a lot of scientists believe it still there's there's a real reluctance of amongst those who've not really engaged with it to engage with it you know they haven't read it yeah um, and yet they still feel empowered to say to you, because I've talked to loads of them, well, you know, it's a bit sort of, it's a bit hippie-ish. It doesn't I was going to, yeah, exactly what I was going to say. It's kind of like a, a bit tree-huggy, kind of. Yeah, that's how people but dismiss whole, it. The whole but... subject matter is a little bit, because... Uh, he, he, when you say the whole subject matter, did you mean consciousness itself? Kind of, yes. That... Um, for example, there was there was one thing that I had that was questioning whether a stone has consciousness. Yeah, and yes. and I'm a little bit okay. I might I might listen to this later on, or I might read about this later on, but I'm I'm not ready to. I don't quite understand whether a stone has. Well, I mean, it's not that hard to put that across. The sort of the fundamental question is: you say, look. Everyone agrees that the universe contains matter. Yeah. You know, physical stuff. Egg. And it contains energy. And we know from Einstein that one can convert itself into the other. Yeah. Uh, when energy gets slow and cold, lots of it turns into solid. Um, solid things. And when you go the other way, it can turn back into energy. Yeah. Um, but nowhere in there is there consciousness. So then the question is this. Can you imagine some form of stuff that suddenly becomes conscious can you get consciousness which seems so completely different i mean think of all the forms of consciousness you've seen yeah teacups cars computers bottles of wine um you know merry-go-rounds doesn't matter how simple or how complicated how big or how small none of them appear to have consciousness yeah so it's then just a, a, it's a matter of faith, pure and simple, to say, okay, there is some complicated way in which you can put matter together and it suddenly becomes aware of its surroundings and itself. So some wiring diagram yeah. suddenly goes, whoo, I'm here. <laughs> um, and no one has the first clue how that happens. And... I must have read, I don't know, over the years, 20 books on consciousness. Yeah. Uh, you know, Dan Dennett's book, which is a very good book, and it's an old one now, but, and it's a great book, except for the title, which is just ridiculous. He calls it Consciousness Explained. And it's not. It's Consciousness Assumed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because well, basically, he I think he, he, might have, that... he, he might have written the title for me, though. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe his um, publisher. Yeah. But but that's the essential problem, is that virtually every book I've ever read about consciousness 
isn't about consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's about the wiring diagram that allows different kinds of thinking once you've got consciousness. Yeah. But no one ever says, and here's how from carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphor, sulfur, iron, you mix them together in a certain way, and instead of getting a pork pie, you get consciousness. Yeah. No one has the first clue. And so then what other people will say is just the idea that everything can be conscious, which is, goes under the term of panpsychism, is they say it sounds, people will, will say, oh, it's ridiculous to say that everything is conscious. But they say, is it more ridiculous to say that stuff that you can put together in a trillion different ways, it still just remains stuff. There is some special way and it goes, oh, hello, I'm here. Let me tell you one of the things that Ian says when people say to him, oh, come on, you can't say to me that you don't really believe that a mountain is conscious, do you? And, and Ian's response to this, which I've heard him give half a dozen times, mm -hmm. is how do you think um, if a mountain was conscious, it would express it? Are you assuming that it would express it the way that we express our consciousness? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. How do you know that the consciousness that may be in matter, how it gets expressed. Okay. One of the sort of the, the first things that gets said in any discussion about consciousness is they people, everyone quotes a man called Thomas Nagel, who's an American philosopher, and he, he came up with this phrase, is it like something to be whatever you're talking about? So he, he said, what was it, what's it like to be a bad? Answer, we don't know, but we feel pretty sure it's like something to be a bat. Whereas I've got a mug in front of me. I don't, I personally don't feel that it's like anything to be a mug. So that's how he, that's Thomas Nagel's way of approaching consciousness. There are some things in the world that we look at and we go, it's like something to be a bat. It doesn't see things the way that we see them. It hears them in, you know, it, it makes up a picture of its world through what it hears, what it echolocates. But it's still like something, whereas I don't think it's like anything to be my rusty old car. So going back to my original question, has a stone got a consciousness? You've answered well, me, but I haven't it, understood the answer. The answer is, according to those who think that consciousness can emerge yeah. from matter and energy through the way that it's wired together, right, the okay. answer is no. Yeah. But... That's an article of faith that it is a matter of a clever wiring diagram. And the other side says, look, what is the basis for thinking that if you just keep wiring up one transistor after another, you'll get consciousness? That's an article of faith. And they say, we think it's much more sensible to say that the three primitive non-reducible constituents of the universe would be matter, energy, and consciousness, or, and in McGilchrist believes this, that he would say consciousness is actually the primitive of the universe. Everything is, consciousness came first, and matter is a phase, something that comes from consciousness. Uh -huh. um, you know, it, it's a bit like, you know, the picture of the Big Bang. At the Big Bang, there was no matter. There was just intensely hot um energy that's it it was just energy and then yeah. in the few you know picoseconds or whatever it is after the big bang as it starts to cool down just like you can get drops of water condensing out of vapor you get matter condensing out of pure energy yeah now all, all that someone like McGilchrist is doing is saying i think that before even you have the the intense burst of um, hot energy that you had consciousness and by some means we don't understand, energy and matter condense out of consciousness, or they're there all along. And to a materialistic worldview, to someone who's brought up in materialism, that sounds potty. It's like, you know, by some means we don't understand, I said. Yeah. And go, yeah, okay, so you're just making it up. And they go, yes. And so are you when you go, yeah, there's there's, there's lots of transistors and wires, and then by some means we don't understand, you can get so complicated it goes, hello, I'm here. But both stories have a by some means we don't understand in them. Uh, why does one seem utterly 
fictitious and fairy tale like and the other one you think yeah that's reasonable that's how it would work and the answer is because you've been brought up in one so you've got a vast prejudice that because you know we used to just hook things together and you you get an abacus but now we hook other things together much more cleverly and you get a, a desktop computer yeah but it's still just hooking stuff together and the desktop computer is not one iota more conscious than an abacus yeah you know, both theories have a place where you just wave your hand and go, well, yeah, we think something happened there. And, you know, the best thing is to be honest and therefore for yeah. neither side to disparage the other yes. on the grounds that, oh, those people are just utterly fatuous. No, you're not. They're no more fatuous than you are. <laughs> you know, the, both theories have a place where we go, I don't know. Well, can we talk about those in a separate podcast? Because I'm, I'm, I'm half following you. Well, I know I'm. I am following you, but I think. Well, no. Let's do one about consciousness, about what we mean by consciousness, because. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I'd, I'll pick you up on one tiny thing here, and and yeah. I'm going backwards. You mentioned quite a few times there, the word faith. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of, the God religion faith taking that step. Yeah, but this. Faith in science. Science has faith in it. You have faith that the hypothesis you're working on is the right one. You have faith that um, uh, your particular scientific model of the world, some people have faith that it's just closer to what reality might be than previous ones. And some people go so far as to say, my model is an accurate representation of reality. It is reality. That's an article of faith. Yeah, yeah. There's faith and belief in science. I mean, it, it, it's one of the things that I think is very wrong, that there's a kind of scientific belief which can be referred to as scientism, which yeah. likes to say yeah. uh, religion and the arts, they are riddled with this weak thinking like metaphor because they can't be, you know, they can't be bothered to concentrate hard enough to be clear and they've got faith. They just, you know, I have faith in this. Well, they believe this. Yes, and us, right. scientists, we don't have any of that rubbish. And that is just a piece of intellectual fatuousness. Science has metaphor, it's built on metaphor, and it has faith and it has belief. And science also has a, a priesthood and, and power relations. Yeah, no, no. It's, yeah, yeah, no, it's as close to religion as damn it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and Rosenberg and Atkins in Why Are We Here, they, they if science doesn't have the answer, the the truth is one day it will yes that's there which is faith. an article of faith by anybody's yeah. <laughs> uh, the but you know what you were saying about um not just signing over uh in democracy just for willy-nilly it reminded me of um do you remember tony ben's five democratic questions no oh, i think i think you're gonna tell me I am. I am because I love Tony Benn. I interviewed him for the uh, 30th anniversary of Horizon and he was really, he was such a star. He was so lovely. Yeah. Um, and it's what we put right at the end of, of the, the film. He says, you know, he's, he's talking about the power of the internet, the power of the, the already billionaires that had control of newspapers and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, you know, Maxwell and Murdoch. Um, and we cut a whole little scene of that. And he said, you know, in this age where there's so much power concentrated in so much, so few hands, you've really got to ask the five democratic questions. What power have you got? Where did you get it from? In whose interest do you use it? To whom are you accountable? And how do we get rid of you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just brilliant. And that, that sums it up because you, we do get our power over in democracy we are supposed to be the source of that power and we do give it up to them but we're not giving it up to them just so they can do whatever the hell they want yes it's and, it's, you, and we have to be able to get rid of them what power have you got where did you get it from in whose interest you exercise it to whom you're accountable and how can we get rid of you and if you can't get rid of the people who govern you you don't live in a democratic system you're in a democracy there's no one stopping you from doing something no the reason, but, but happening is is you're not doing it. Yes, and and I think things in the democracy are are stacked against 
me because I will vote for somebody and they will get in and they will make no fucking difference. Right, but in a democracy, you can decide you're going to vote for somebody else. Yeah, they won't. Well, you're going to a uh, party that doesn't exist yet. But these are all actual yes. still options. You're not living under a dictatorship where if you even voice it, someone comes and shoots you. So, yeah, it's going to be hard. Yeah, you think, bloody hell, that'd be a lot of work. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in democracy, in theory at least, you do have the tools to do something about it. Yeah. Yes, the tools have been locked away largely by powers that don't want to use them, and they're rusty. But fuck me sideways, you can still do it. And if therefore you don't do it, that was your choice. I, 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 this is the thing that I've been fighting with, because part of me, in a lot of chats that we've had, I'm like, going, do you know what, I just want to go off grid. I mean, fuck it. I'd leave them to it. But then ultimately, I equally know, what if I do that, I've got no comeback. Yeah, see, I don't want to go off the grid. I want to Pop actually down. confront these people. Yeah, no, I'd like to confront them, but I'm, I don't see any of the pathways to confront them without getting arrested for telling people to pull out their... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I to, have to resort to violence uh, is a failure of the imagination, and we know how that ends. You just have to look at well, Gaza. Yeah, and worse, it's not... They've got bigger guns than you. Yeah. If you wait to fight the war, A, you're going to... A lot of people will die, and B, you'll lose. You have to fight the peace. That's now. Oh, no, totally. I, I totally, um, um, yeah. Free to... Which is why I think it's worth thinking about and, and, and sketching out. You know, if the... I can, see, get... I can see your tactic, David. Get people frightened. Get people worried. Well, that's that's the same the but maybe outraged, maybe at least interested. I don't know. Yeah, and maybe they'll get off the fat backsides and do something about it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. They may be chip-munching morons, but there's a lot of them. Yes. Yeah. It only takes it's, a small percentage to actually yeah, pick up. Does. I mean, you know, if you, if you mentioned um, Gaza. You only have, a, have to look at the number of people um, that are going on these protests. And it gets on yeah. all the news. And it's a damn sight better than throwing jam at the Mona Lisa, I would have said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... That's why I think it's worth talking about. But, you know, if you want to have a discussion about having these hypothetical discussions, does it leave you feeling, well, what's it for? I, I don't mind doing that. I mean, no, I just, I, 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 I'm trying to, I, I don't want to say sitting on the fence again. I'm, I'm just split between, there's some days I wake up and I feel like anyone else, I feel good. And I'm like, yeah, there's a fight. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm ready to have it. And then other days I'm like, do you know what? I could just slip away, build a log cabin in a forest somewhere and just go off grid. It's not really a viable strategy, though, is it? No, no, it's not. But I think it's it's where people get to. And a... Yeah, yeah no, I agree. And and the harder your life is, the, the more difficult it is to listen to someone who's trying to convince you that you've got another problem you should deal with. But that, that and that's, that's kind of where... I, where that's kind of high plan. That's where I've got to, which is, okay, I can afford a bit of time to poke my mm -hmm. head above the parapet and, and ask a question of all well, what's been going on. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I just like to occasionally ask what is not going on yet. Yeah, I, I, well, what is going on is is that, well, nothing's been done about this and nothing's been done about that and nothing's changed. And actually, divides are getting wider um, yeah. and and it's unfair and, and and i ask the question as a lot of people do is well what can we do and and they all all oh, right to your i feel your like we have been recording in this conversation we are recording this conversation yes yeah. sneaky you so sneaky i know well i just occasionally yeah, actually, I'll I'll never think. trust a man with a microphone and a mixer well uh, more importantly a big red button <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah uh, don't uh, touch the big red button. Don't touch the big I'm glad you recorded it because it is, It is. you know, is it worth doing hype land? Well, yeah, otherwise we wouldn't be doing that. And I do think trying to, I don't want to have every podcast be about something which lamentable, which has already happened. It seems like a, an infinitesimally better situation to talk about something lamentable before it's quite happened. Yeah. I don't, there's a small chance you could stop it. Yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, to be a commentator on things that we feel aren't being commentated on well, or there's a slant, or there's 
you know, uh, an unfair story or narrative that's being told. Having another another view of it, a different narrative yeah. from the one that we're constantly fed, even that's worth something, even if the, the narrative you offer isn't it isn't one hundred percent correct. Yeah. It, 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 even if it's just differently wrong, yeah. at least it gives people and you know some perspective to go. Well, hang on a second. Yeah. Because if you only ever hear the same self-serving narrative from the same small group of very powerful people, you know they are watched. They do own the companies. They do own the banks. They do own the newspapers and the yeah. You, and they do mostly own your politicians. I don't like that feeling. No, no. I really don't. No, but then, like, that, I, don't, I don't want my children to, to you know, turn around and go, so wait a minute, Dad, you just sort of sat back and had another cup of tea while this went on. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or I escaped and, and built my log cabin. It, it's that image that you paint there, which is kind of like you turn around and you realise that everything is this brick wall to you, that there is no smashing through it. And, and, but and there is. I mean, that's the thing, Ian. We know there is because... You know, my great grandfather's um, generation, he was born in in a Victorian boarhouse. Yeah, and and there were no labour rights. Uh, he started work down a mine when he was fourteen, and his son started work down a mine when he was yeah. fourteen. My grandfather, but in his lifetime, he his father and he had begun to form the National Union of Miners. They had begun to form the the Labour Party as the Labour Party once yeah. was. They did bring in the National Health Service. They did bring in universal school schooling up to age. Well, it got up to age eighteen at one point. Yeah. So, and they had more stacked against them. And while my grandfather was a as a man I'm, I've always looked up to, I don't think he was superhuman. It's, I figure if he can do it, why the hell can't I? Yeah. yeah. And people like me. What? I it's too you difficult for, for me. It's too yep. difficult for my generation. What? Well, I, yeah, they didn't have the politics that we've got. No, but they did have people who were quite willing to shoot them. <laughs> didn't they? Well, that's okay. At least then you know what the action is. You shoot them back. But again, we'll get arrested for this, for inciting violence or something. I'm not. I'm, I'm saying... <laughs> Do something about it while you can. Fight the peace. Don't wait for the war. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. But, of course, you know, when it's peaceful, you think, oh, what's the brush? Well, that's been the problem. Yeah. I'm dancing on next. Yeah. Do I really have yeah. to? You know, yes, you do, you lazy bastard. Yeah, hang on. I'm just getting a, a, a fast food takeaway delivered to my door. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. um, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed it, please leave a review. And if you'd like to leave a comment, which would be great, we've set up a Hyperland Substack. So go to Substack, look up Hyperland, leave us a comment. We'd love to know what you think. And if you've got ideas that we should cover, that'd be great too. That's it. Thank you.